There you go. Perfect. So, let's see. Looks like we're live, it says. Yeah. Give me a second and I'll uh, good to go. Good. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to one of our, uh, another one of our international ground round. I'm very pleased once again to have Osvaldo Riquez uh, from Emory University back with us. It's, uh, it's uh, really a pleasure for me to have him once again. If you didn't check out the previous talk in regards to um, some of the great management of uh, orbital fracture, I will support and I suggest you to go on our YouTube page and look out to that. But today, uh, Osvaldo, first of all, good morning. Good morning. So Osvaldo is going to talk about the management of mid-face fracture or the fractures that are involving uh, the face. And in regards to this, uh, uh, he's going to talk about some updates and how he and his team are managing those complex fractures. And make sure that as usual you remember that uh, every question should be asked type in your questions and we will reply at the end of his presentation so if we're good to go Osvaldo thank you for being with us today and please share your presentation thank you so much I appreciate you guys having me again here it's been a pleasure and good day to everyone where you are coming from let me share my screen real quick and hopefully you're seeing it now and you guys are seeing this, Puya, looks good? Looks great. Perfect, all right, so yes, yeah. so again, good day, everyone. Hopefully you guys are staying safe wherever you are and happy holidays. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this again, uh, of this effort to spread some knowledge around the world. And today, as Puya mentioned, I'm gonna be talking to you about, you know, a little bit about the diagnosis and management of mid-phase fractures. Um, I come to you from, the United States, the city of Atlanta, where I work in the Emory University Hospital. Uh, I got nothing to disclose. I am a faculty and speaker for the AOCMF uh, here in North America. And when I give talks on behalf of the AOCMF, I do get uh, royalties from that, but that's not the case in this case. And this is our new logo right here. I work in one of our big county hospitals. It's called Gray Memorial Hospital here in the US. It's probably one of the biggest hospitals in the whole country, uh, about 900 beds. And it's one of the level one trauma hospitals. So a big part of my practice, uh, even though I'm a rhinologist, school is surgeon by trade, is the management and uh, of this uh, official trauma at all. So we see a, a fair amount of that. So, but I do everything that comes through the door really. And that's usually what we talk, we call it our division. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about anatomy, which I think it's key for any pathology that we do surgically. Uh, a few points, interesting points about the historical perspective of these of these injuries, how we diagnose them, how we classify them, and then we're going to go through some cases uh, to, sh to showcase how we manage these cases. This is actually a talk that I give to my residents, so sometimes I do make it interactive, but of course this this format here won't won't permit that, but. Uh, I'll, I'll share one disclaimer about the cases you're about to see. Uh, these are cases from the past eight years. When you look at the post-op scans, uh, you see some of the plates that were, maybe they were put in place. Looking back now, I probably would have done something different. And some of the plates uh, kind of like, you know, at the time makes sense, but I don't know why we did it. So it'll be interesting to see your opinion on that. I'm also going to showcase some new, some new technologies, not new, new, but something that we, you know, we have available now that you might not be using, but it's in your uh, in your disposal. And, and of course, in the COVID era, sometimes I like to mention a few things to keep in mind, uh, uh, some, some, some things that we need to keep in mind. Things that we are not going to be talking today is, we're not really going to be talking about isolating some fractures that in its own is pretty simple, but also a different talk. Uh, I, I gave a previous talk of specific on the management of orbital floor fractures. So today, I'm not gonna be really discussing much about uh, how we handle these fractures. Uh, I'm also not gonna be touching much on the soft tissue trauma, you know, uh, and specifically ballistic trauma like this ones, which here in the US we see a lot of this, but also by itself, that's a, that's a whole different topic. And, and I do have a talk about ballistic injuries that maybe in the future we can do. And the last thing that I will show, it's NOE fractures uh, specifically, uh, as you all know, if you, if you handle those fractures, these are very complicated and complex. 
and on their own are uh, a specific topic. So I'm not gonna really go into much of that, just most of the four fractures today. So as I mentioned, I think anatomy is key. Uh, and this is something that, you know, hangs in the office of my boss here at Emory. And it's true when it comes to anatomy. And when we talk about the mid face, we talk about the, the area that is seen here in this cartoon in yellow. And, and it's an important area for many reasons, of course. One of them being that, uh, you know, the nasal bone skeleton, the zygoma, including the arch, basically acts as a, uh, as a link between the mandible and the forces of mastication and occlusion, which are very strong, and our cranial vault. So it's, it's an area of transitional forces, which is very important. Also, as we all know, uh, there's a lot of facial muscles, a very complex area when it comes to the musculature of the mid face and the face in general, which complicates sometimes uh, the management of these injuries. Another thing to keep in mind too is that that makes this area unique is over 12 cranial nerves, six of them travel through the mid face. So that's another thing just to keep in mind. Uh, going through the basics, and you might remember this from the time that you uh, maybe we were reviewing this back in your residency. You know, we talk about this concept of facial buttresses of the mid face, so almost columns that support our mid face. And we divide them in horizontals and vertical buttresses. Uh, horizontal, the common names are the supraorbital buttress, the infraorbital, and the zygomatic arches also, uh, and mandible, and, and maxilla. Uh, well, an easy way of talking about this maybe is, is, to, is to talk about the superior, middle, um, and, and inferior buttresses. And the vertical ones, which actually tend to be one of the most important ones when it comes to reestablishing the, the function and form of the mid phase, we talk about a medial one or the nasomaxillary one. We talk about the lateral one or zygomatic maxillary one, which is this right here. And we talk about a posterior one or the trigomaxillary one. So nowadays, I just really refer as the medial, lateral, and posterior buttresses. These are also important because usually when I'm plating, uh, I'm trying to put the plates in the buttresses because are the areas of the more stronger bone. Uh, so just keep that concept in mind always. And one way to think about these buttresses is like if you see the, the face and your, your face as a, as a canopy, as a tent, your buttresses are sort of like the poles that keep up the soft tissue, which is the, the actual tent that just drapes around your face. So if you restore the length and, and position of these buttresses when you're trying to come out with a, a surgical plan, usually you already have more than half of the job done as far as re restoring the form of, of the mid face. So how do things present? Well, you know, of course, uh, it depends on the mechanism of, of, uh, of, of the trauma. Uh, we see a lot of low velocity trauma, like assault, ground level falls, uh, sports injury nowadays. Also, we see a lot of that. But also in this day and age, we see a lot of high velocity trauma. So falls from high story, from more than one story building or high speed motor vehicle accidents is something that we see a lot here. Uh, and it's interesting, you know, even though with the advent of airbag, seatbelt, and, and both nowadays, um, the actual, you know, the incidence of facial fractures have pretty, pretty much remained the same. I do think the difference probably is, is the type of fractures that we're seeing is a little bit different. So, you know, for example, NOE fractures used to be a, a lot more common back in the day before airbags, because every time that people had an accident in the car, they hit their face with a steering wheel or, or, or front of the car. And now with airbags, uh, it's a little bit less injury. So, you know, even in, in, in a basic trauma center, as uh, Grady, uh, where I work, you know, I might see a handful of NOE, uh, of which maybe one of them is a type three NOE or something like that. But if you talk to the, my colleagues that have been doing this for longer than I have in the era prior to airbags, uh, they used to see multiple ones every week. So I think the people that wrote the book on NOE fractures did it before that. And it's something that they nowadays, thankfully, we don't see that often. This is typical, you know, pictures that we see a lot uh, in books nowadays, you know, the typical raccoon eyes on, on the, uh, that, that talks about scoliosis fractures in the right side, the typical flattened face. And those are things that are important just to recognize. But nowadays, most of the time, at least in my practice, when we are called to see these patients, even for the first time, we are talking uh, about, you know, people already come with a CT scan. You know, we see these things that we do in the office, you know, that people are described to do in an awake patient. 
And these are great maneuvers to do to sort of, you know, evaluate the, the, the status of the, of the mid phase if it's mobile. Uh, that being said, in this picture, this patient seems very happy to do this. However, uh, as you can imagine, this, if there's a fracture, this hurts pretty bad. So sometimes this part of the exam we have to do when the patient is either intubated or in the OR because it's just too, uh, too painful. Keep in mind also that this, these patients usually have other injuries just because the amount of force that takes to injure these structures uh, usually results in other injuries such as intracranial injuries, spine injuries, skull base injuries. Uh, as I mentioned, NOE important injuries are very commonly missed or at least missed people want to deal with them. And mandibular injuries of fractures of the mandibles are important to recognize and treat because sometimes that's going to be part of the plan. And for the most part, if the orbital, um, uh, if, if the orbit is involved, I always want to get a consult from ophthalmology. So I don't take any patient to the OR without at least a note from ophthalmology with a basal exam if I want to be instrumenting anything around the orbit. So how do we classify the mid fractures? So we all heard, you know, the classic classification is L4 classification, L4, 1, 2, 3. This is a picture of an L4, which at the beginning of last century was a renowned surgeon that described, and actually it's very interesting. You can find his original paper online, uh, which he published in two, in two, uh, in two uh, publications. And I, I'm sad to say that most of you probably have heard stories about, you know, the four doing these experiments, throwing cadaver heads of the top of his, uh, of his house and see how things, uh, how the fractures happen. But that's really a myth. He, he never threw anything off the window. What he did do is that on his lab, he actually, most of his experiments were actually done on full body cadavers. And he, he hit the face of these cadavers with things like, you know, marble and bats and things like that. And he described what he called at the time, the great lines of weakness of the face. And this is actually are his drawings from his, uh, from his uh, studies, showing the areas of most commonly where the fractures happen. And of course, nowadays we talk about, you know, the, for a type one, like we see here, a type two and a type three right here. I think the most, the most important thing is that to be a truly four, one of the things that has to happen is that your pterygoid plates have to be involved. If not, it's not really gonna be a the four fracture and probably was not gonna be mobile, okay? But also all of us that deal with these fractures, we all know that this is nice to have and it's a useful classification, but not all fractures says follow those patterns. And it's an example here, this is not, you know, a four five, you know, because usually they're way more complex than, than just a four one, two, three. But it's what we have, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's one of the best, best classification. You know, the AO has, has made a classification system a little more complex and more specific. They divide the classification different levels, level one through five, uh, level one through four, and they have each area of the of the of the face uh, with a number. And then as you break down the areas, there's different in level two, for example, there's letters to uh, to go through the different bones and fractures. Uh, but to be honest, this is way too complicated, and I think it's useful for research. So for example, you can actually download a software that lets you classify these, these fractures. And I think it's good for research, but it hasn't really cut off, uh, cut on a lot when, uh, when it comes to clinical practice. So now let's talk a little about management. And this is a famous phrase quoted by Dr. Paul Manson, which is one of the pioneers of, of, of modern management of facial trauma um, from, from Hopkins University. And he always says that you never get a second chance of primary reconstruction. Meaning that when, you, when you're gonna fix these patients, you really wanna try to do the best job the, fir the first time. It's always hard to go back and, and try to fix what you, what's been done before. Uh, just to take a also a little bit about history, you might recognize this picture of this is uh, Dr. Sir Harold Gillies. Uh, you know, you probably know about the Gillies technique to treat our orbital arch, um, uh, sigmatic arch fractures. And he's really considered one of the fathers of reconstruction of plastic surgery. But I always give a hard time to my plastic colleagues that he actually was an ENT, an otorinolaryngologist. So, you know, we, we make their specialty from the beginning. Uh, and of course, as is being put it before, you know, war is the, one of the best uh, teachers of, for surgeons and definitely was the case, you know, back in the day and during his war experience, you know, managing these injuries you could see how, you know, he, he wrote the book in how to, 
how to manage this a lot of these fractures. And it's pretty impressive. Again, you can actually uh, find his his book online, and you can see some of these pictures, which are amazing. You know, uh, and the the results that he had with 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 some devices that he that he actually pioneered. But even Gillis early on, you know, he he, he talked about the importance of reestablishing the normal tissue as early as possible and getting it back to normal position. Uh, you know, also in early in mid-century, you know, people people used to deal with these fractures during these suspension wires, so these atom suspension wires, um, which uh, were more, much more complex. But you know, in the 1980s, thank God we. We had a lot of new advances, you know, the, the, the advent of high resolution CT scan, you know, the plates and screws that's been now designed and it's our gold standard of how we deal with this. And of course, the uh, development of techniques to do extended approaches that let us uh, get access to these areas to be able to treat them. Uh, but the goals really remain the same regardless of how you treat this, you know, and the goals really, the way that I, summarize this is that you always want to think about form and function right and when it comes to form height and projection of the face is very important uh, and when it comes to function we're talking about things like occlusion orbital floor fractures and orbital function and the integrity of the nose of course and you know and i mean again the challenge of these fractures are they're usually not isolated sometimes they have other injuries as i mentioned before sometimes you have to wait for those other injuries to be handled like spine and things like that and when you combine those with maybe some soft tissue injuries some that also can access uh can uh bring a whole different challenge uh this is a, a typical picture of the flattened face again that i showed you before and this is important because if you see that you need to address that that flattened face you need to address that projection of the face and some people have probably used this before. Uh, I always like to take this out on the OR and show the residents because they get, you know, and do this. And this is just, you know, we use it, this role is in passion forces to literally pull the face back into place up. Uh, and if you don't do that, and if you don't recognize that, you're gonna have an issue. And this is, a, you know, this patient, uh, this is a case from the AO website that, that we use a lot in our courses. Uh, and it shows you typically, you know, the occlusion being an open bite before they're establishing. And then when you, when you reestablish that projection, you can actually get the patient back in occlusion. And it's important to do this and to recognize this because if you don't recognize this and you don't do anything about the projection, you can always put the patient back in occlusion even when it's in this position because the, the mandible is, is mobile. And what happens is this, is that if you try to align your mandible to a maxilla that's in the wrong position, the maxilla, you might be able to get an occlusion by taking the mandible off of the joint but then when you finish the case and you take the patient off of, off of your MMF or whatever MMF you use, uh, he's gonna have an anterior open bite. And that's a really hot, bad problem to have. So this is a little bit of my checklist that I have these patients. Of course, when these patients come to the trauma bay, the first thing that we go through is, uh, you know, our advanced trauma life support uh, checklist, making sure the patient is stable, airway, everything like that. One that once that's done, we like to define the fracture type and then we, we start looking at our goals, you know, which, which parts of the function do we need to address? Which parts of the form do we need to address? Uh, and then once we have that, okay, so do we need to repair some fractures or some fractures we don't have to repair? And if so, which fractures are we just gonna observe? Which fractures might just require a close reduction or which fractures might require an open reduction with internal fixation? If we are to explain to the OR, then okay, a big part of this is, okay, how are we gonna manage the airway? We're going to have a few cases just to talk about how we do that. Uh, also, how we're going to reestablish the premorbid occlusion, because usually your occlusion, as I mentioned, is your starting point in a, where you build up all these cases as far as alignment, too. And, what, uh, and what, how way, how, which method of MMF are you going to use? Then, which buttresses I'm going to, need, I'm going to have to repair? And if so, I'm going to, how, how I'm going to access those buttresses as far as my incisions? Or if they're missing because they are completely gone or completely macerated, you know, I'm gonna have to use any bone grafting or even have to, you know, free graft in, in more complex cases. Once I have this, then I have to figure out, you know, how I'm gonna sequence this, meaning like in which order I'm gonna I'm gonna fix these fractures. Uh, and then one thing that I that I'm gonna touch base in the cases that I'm gonna show you 
is the concept of soft tissue resuspension. And this is something that I'll be honest, when I first started my practice, I used to go in there, fix the bone, and I didn't really pay much attention of resuspension of the soft tissue. And then you realize that these patients, just, they just don't look normal, even once the swelling goes down. So this is a, a part that nowadays I, I'm, I really point out in my patients and all my, and, and, and all my residents. So let's go back through some, uh, through some cases. Uh, again, these are cases from the past few years. Some of them I, put, I would have done differently nowadays as far as the plating and you're gonna see the way the plating goes. Uh, but we're gonna start from, from simple to complex, right? And this is a very simple case. This probably was a patient that had a blow to the face, the side of the face, comes in with this. So you can see here an isolated stigmatic arch fracture. Um, and the challenge here is that if you go by physical exam, oops, sorry, by physical exam, these patients sometimes, uh, you know, they look fine because the swelling makes up for that dent that might be in the, in the side of the face. But when I see something like this and I go through my, my, my mental thing, okay, how am I gonna, do I need to fix this? I'm gonna just probably yes. Like we need to at least reduce this. This is a case that I probably would do a close reduction. You know, I don't need, I don't need to play necessarily this because to play this, you probably would have to do a bacterial approach. You can't really just cut straight into the bone there. So there's no need to do this. So as far as how, you know, what are your options in how to do a close reduction for this patient? You know, there's two classic techniques. The temporal approach of name also the Gills approach, which is very simple as we see here, or the transoral and kin approach. Um, this, you know, which approach I, I choose depends on a couple of things, you know. Uh, one of the main things is that how old is this fracture? So if this is a patient that just had the injury, you know, a few days ago or even maybe a week ago, I tend to go with a Gillis approach because the amount of force required to put that bone into place uh, is pretty, it's not that hard. But if it's an older fracture, a couple of weeks, few weeks, and I'm not, I'm gonna have to put so much force, I tend to favor the keen approach or the trans oil approach. And the reason why is because there's been some, that some case reported that if you put a lot of force uh, through a Gillis approach, you can actually fracture the, the temporal bone in. So you have to be careful about that. Uh, another thing to consider is also, you know, if the patient is bald, doesn't have any hair, you may not want to put any incisions in the skin. So, you know, maybe a, a trans oil approach might be the best way. And again, this patient, we just did that. It was very easy to do this. Here's another case, uh, case number two, a little more complex. This is a patient, MBC, and this is your, your 3D reconstructions. We can see here that, so looking at this patient, one of the things that I look over, okay, which ways are fractured, which, which, which buttresses are affected here? And I'm looking here that in my vertical buttress, my middle buttress is affected by this fracture. Also my lateral buttress here is affected. And also my posterior buttress, you can see the three wood plates are affected in, in both sides of the face. There's no much distortion as far as, it, there's no much impaction of the mandible going posteriorly, which is good. And then we have a fracture here, but it's not displaced. And in this case, the little floors were intact. So this is one of those rare cases really that it's a typical the fourth one or, or, as, or as close as the fourth one as you would see. So then I go through my things, you know, what I'm gonna do with this patient? I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna observe it. Probably not because that's, it, it is mobile. Uh, so it needs to be reinforced. Can I do close reduction? Again, probably no, because uh, we need to do something to keep the bone in place. So this is a patient that we have to do open reduction and tunnel fixation. And you know, something, I'm talking like this, and this comes from, from the AO website uh, app. It's, it's, it's a great resource to do, and this is a, one way of doing it, right? To, you know, and how, and how would I approach this? Well, I probably would approach this through a vestibular incision under the lip, easy enough to do. Um, and then the next question is that how I'm gonna, how am I gonna manage the airway? And this, again, this patient was awake, was just breathing fine. Um, so what are your options? So oral intubation, probably not because I need to be able to put this patient in, in, in back into occlusion with even wires or arch bars. So having an oral tube is not really an option here. Um, and nasotracheal intubation, probably not ideal because having the tube in the nose here sometimes can impede the way that you reduce a fracture. A trach probably will be too aggressive for a patient that's just awake, but you could do it. You can intubate the patient and then trach it. But one technique that I've been using uh, for a while is being uh, the, the submental intubation. And this was something that 
uh, I have used for a long time. Uh, I didn't really understand it at the beginning when I used to hear my oral surgery colleagues, how do you do that? Because in my mind, is that I thought that when, when we talk about some mental intubation, we talk about putting the tube through the neck at the beginning and getting the airway control. And it's not really anything like that. What you really do is that you intubate the patient orally, as you normally would, uh, ideally with a reinforced tube like this one. And once the patient is intubated, you basically make a small incision in the submental area in front of the submandibular gland, right behind the mandible, just big enough so you can then add to, so the tube would feed. And then through there, you actually can put a hemostat into the front of mouth, make an incision in the front of mouth, and then just grab your tube from the mouth and pull it down through the neck. Do your case, and then at the end of the case, pull the tube back into the mouth, and then just extubate the patient. There's actually great videos online that you can find techniques, how to use techniques. There's different ways of doing it, but it's a great thing to, uh, to keep in mind for these cases. Again, as I mentioned, for these cases, I would approach it through a vestibular approach, specifically a maxillary vestibular approach. Um, and this is what the patient looked like. Again, uh, this plate, looking back, I probably would have put this plate the other way around. Uh, I don't know what me and my residents were thinking, but it worked. The patient actually was aligned and the patient is doing well. Key thing here is, is uh, the, again, the concept of soft tissue resuspension. Uh, if, you, if you make an incision and do nothing about it, you're gonna have a whining nose in, this, in, in, in these patients. You're also gonna have inversion in the upper lip. So when I close these patients after my approach, one thing that I do sometimes is this stitching suture, which is, this is just basically putting a non-absorbable suture from the soft tissue from one side to the other to pinch that nose in. Or another option is that to close your incision, your mucosal incision in a V to Y fashion, and that helps actually support those soft tissues again. So let's go to another case. Again, going a little more complicated. You can see here, this patient here, multiple fractures. This patient is intubated. You can see that there was other injuries going around and that's why this patient is in the ICU. And again, when I'm looking at this patient, I'm looking, okay, do we need to fix him? Yes. Um, how are we gonna, what do I need to, uh, uh, to address? Well, let's go to, uh, to our buttresses. We have to address this lateral vertical buttress or CF suture or single frontal suture is affected in both sides. Also part of a lateral buttress or muscular sigmatic suture is, is affected or middle buttress is affected, and hor or horizontal buttresses here are affected too. So these are all the things that we need to do. So then then it's how are we gonna, how are we gonna ac access all this to fix it? Well, you know, we talk, of course, we already talked about these two, we can actually do so to a maxillary incision, but these two we probably can access through interorbital approaches. So one option for the lateral buttress, this right here is either just a lateral bro incision, which is easy enough to do, but it's cosmetically probably not the best option, but you can also do like a hemi, uh, you know, brow, uh, clef, sorry, hemi, um, uh, shoot, I, I'm backing out, in, incision here that would do for bleph, for blepharoplasties. And that also gives, gives you access to all this area shaded here in green. It, it has great cosmetic results. Of course, for the, for the, lateral, for the inferior lateral rim, I tend to favor more transcranial incisions than skin incisions, uh, the infraorbital, but those are also available for you there. And this is just shown here different techniques that you can use to, to basically mix impact the zygoma if need be, either the bone hook or the carotid screw, which is very useful. Um, again, soft tissue suspension, when I do these cases, I like, I make sure that I, I just, I'm not just closing the skin, but especially you, you're closing that periosteum again, uh, you're making sure that you're suspending that tissue back at the end of the case. And in this case, we did all this, and this is what it looks like. You know, this is what I call a, a rep's dream. You know, you, you can see here that neurosurgery had to do a cranium for some bleed. So this is all what's well done by that. And then and in our case, the orbital floors were intact, but we were able to reestablish all the plates of the buttresses. I, uh, with some kind of, you know, we had to get a little creative with the way the plates were as far as where to put them. You can see where we're able to have access to all this. So moving forward, this case right here, again, this is an, another patient that came to the ER. You can see that phantom, the phantom place, um, a face on the one side, this patient was intubated. And this is a special scan. You can see the whole right hemi face is just crushed inwards and in a very complex manner. So going through the same process again here, you know, we're seeing the same buttresses that we saw before affected, but also we're seeing the arc is completely affected and in multiple pieces, right? And this is a case that we have to do something about it. So how, how can we actually, 
play and access all these buttresses. So besides the the similar access that we talked about, yeah, you know, we, we could do like the last case, do the same incisions, but then we won't have access to this arc to be able to play it. And in this case, really, is when a bicoronal incision or coronal incision really comes into place. And this gives you access to this whole area of the cranial facial skeleton right here. This is just different ways that you can make your incision. You can extend this, especially if you're going to access the sigmatic arch, you, may, you need to make, make these extensions. I like the pericular extension, but you can also do postauricular extensions. This is just, again, this is information that's pretty basic. So uh, for the sake of time, I don't want to go, but you know how, which planes you go through. I usually do go right above the pericranium because sometimes we have to raise a pericranial flap. And here, this is just to showcase importance of how, as you raise in the flap, you have to protect that temporal branch of the facial nerve and making sure that you're going deep, either deep into the, uh, into the facial plane as you go into somatic arch or just make an incision higher up where you see that, that fat to making sure that your nerve is in your, is in, is in your flap. And this is a, a case to sh uh, that we want to showcase some of our basically basic newer technology like this one. You can actually get the use of virtual planning where you can get you know segment all the different pieces of your fracture, virtually put them back into place. And once you do that, you can actually you know create models so, such as this one uh, that kind of help you prevent your plates and uh, out of great use for for the OR. I think nowadays, nowadays with 3D printing, there's either easier ways to do this. And this is a 3D printer that we have here that we use for oil floor fractures. And it's, you know, the technology is getting better. It's not perfect, but it's getting better for this. And again, same thing here that I mentioned before, things to do. Another thing that we use is that, you know, as you see this case, and I'm gonna go back here, there's a lot of bones that we have to move. And how do we get any feedback in the OR of, are the bones back in place in the right place? And one, one thing that I would use here a lot is this, is interoperative CAT scan. And this is something that we have available here. And it just really just adds uh, about, you know, 10, you know, 10 minutes to my case. And after I, I basically done the case before I wake up the patient, I do a spin on this, uh, on the CAT scan. And it, and it tells me in real time how my plates are looking if I need to do any modification. It's a great instrument to have. Uh, this is something that I, I remember seeing it for the first time in different talks when I first started my practice. And I saw, oh, that's neat, but that's, you know, there's no way they're gonna buy me that in the hospital. And then I realized that we had one because my spine surgeons use this also for the spine cases. And of course the spine doctors have a much, much more influence than I do when it comes to buying expensive toys in the hospital. So we had it here and we started using it. And nowadays for, for any case that I do in mid phase or oil floor, I usually, you know, spin this patient. And again, it, it, it takes just about five, 10 to 12 minutes at your case. Another option also is you can use your image guidance system, the same image guidance system that you use for your sinus cases. If you have that narrow navigator, you can use this too. And instead of having a scan, you can actually use your navigation to put your, your probe in the, in the segments that you move and you can get an idea of how far out you are to the point you want to restrict. So just different tips. These are great instruments to use. They are they getting smaller every day. The amount of radiation that we use tends to be very, very small nowadays. So it's pretty safe. And if you go through the papers, really, uh, you can see that uh, about 30% of the time you might do some, you might change something. And I, I think that holds true in my practice. I would say in my case, about 25% of the time. And when it comes to mixed phase, it's about, you know, depending on what you're doing, it's about 25% or so, depending on which how complex the fracture is. I think one of the critiques of this paper or any paper that looks at this kind of rate of, of revision is that, you know, are there things that you're seeing there in the OR that if you would see post-op, you would say, well, yeah, it's not perfect, but the patient probably will do fine and you wouldn't do anything about it? Probably true. There's things that you probably would, would be more forgiving in a post-op scan, maybe a few weeks later. Uh, but it's something used to keep in mind. Here again, you're showing the importance of resuspending the soft tissue when you're doing these macronal approaches, the same thing, resuspend your uh, your fascias here, spending your, orbit, your, your orbital muscles, your periorbital muscles here. Uh, and this is this case. Look, this is why we, this is a post-op scan that was, that was done for a different reason. 
Um, and we see here, you know, all the playing that we were able to do, but the patient did really well. And this is him just a couple of weeks post-op, still some swelling, but the, the, the projection of the face is much better than we used to have. And this is just to showcase that for the management of these fractures nowadays, uh, we sort of, you know, can use technology that we, you know, we probably know about because we use, you know, as I mentioned to you in, in my previous talk about with the floor, you can also use endoscopes sometimes to manage these fractures the interval scan, the navigator. Uh, you know, this is a case that I showed that I showed you in my last talk, and just a just an orbital floor fracture. But just to showcase, let's see if it plays. It doesn't look like it's playing, so I might skip it. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. It's not really playing. Sorry about that. But it was just to showcase the use of endoscope image guidance in orbital floor fractures. So, with that in mind, you know. I just wanted to, you know, finish by just taking you to give you my take on points. You know, of course, anatomy is always key uh, for for this for the of this of these injuries. Uh, always think about the function of the form as far as your goals of treatment for these patients. Take your time to plan the surgery. And again, some of these patients are very complex. So, and there's a lot of things you're gonna have to address. So, one thing that I actually didn't mention that I sort of borrow from my colleagues from facial plastics that do rhinoplasties is that I actually have a list, an actual printed list of all the things that I wanna do in which order. And I print that and I put it in my OR outside. And when, as I'm doing the case, I'm looking back, okay, we address this buttress. Let's make sure that we're doing this. Let's make sure that we're doing that. So that way I'm not missing anything in the middle of the case. You know, trauma is not the sexiest thing to do in our practice and it always happens on top of a very busy practice. So these cases tend to be done late at night, in the middle of the day after some cases. So you wanna make sure that you have a good plan so you're not getting frustrated. Uh, and then again, make use of the technology that we have available. And of course, make sure that you are addressing the soft tissue at the end of the case, that's very important. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you again for having me here. It's a great talk. This is a, you know, great is where I work and you know, it's been a great school and a, for me as a surgeon, and I will be happy to answer any questions that you know you may have. And thank you again for having me here. Thank you, Osvaldo, for the brilliant presentation as usual. So once again, for those who missed uh, the video that you tried to play, you can go back and you watch the previous talk from uh, from uh, Osvaldo Riquez uh, in our YouTube channel. So uh, I was fascinated about uh, the. Um, intubation, the submental intubation. And I was really, really, really interested in that. And I will ask you more details in regard to this. As you said, completely fine. It looks pretty normal to you now, but to me, it looks uh, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, as I mentioned, like, I remember reading books and, you know, going through uh, different courses when I was teaching them. My or so this technique is being used for a long time for oral surgeons. Uh, it's also been used a lot nowadays for sleep medicine uh, surgery when they're doing the advancements for, for people with sleep apnea. But in my mind, when I heard that term, as I mentioned, I always thought that they meant that they are putting the person to sleep and somehow getting the airway through the, through the neck. And it's, it's so simple. It, it really takes five minutes. It's just basically just, as I mentioned, you intubate through the mouth and then you feed the tube through the floor of mouth into the neck. Um, and there's actually, uh, I can share, I can show you some videos. A colleague of mine, I think, that used to be an Emory as a sleep surgeon, has a nice video. And actually he uses, I don't know if you, if you ever do done percutaneous tracheostomies, yeah. they have this, it's a blue rhino, it's called the blue rhino adapter. It's like this little blue uh, dilator that we use for the tricks. You can use that through the mouth to dilate and sort of feed the channel. And then you're just left with a little incision, but it's a great technique for patients that do not need a trach uh, mm -hmm. for something that they're going to be awake the next day or even after the surgery. So it's, I it's like a, that. It's like the Seldinger, the, 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 yeah, the guy that you're using. Yeah. You, you can use that. To be honest, I, uh, I usually just use a, a hemostat and I go through the skin here after I make them skin cut. And you can definitely go to the front of mouth, feel it, make a cut in the mucosa, feed the, the hemostat and just... You take the adapter out of the of the endotracheal tube, so you can actually, and then you pass the balloon, then you pass the tube, and then you put the adapter back and cook it up to the ventilator. It's very simple, and it's 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 a great tool to have in your in your armamentarium. And you just replied to one of those questions because there's a lot of 
people asking that they were fascinated about this. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of our, you know, watcher and, uh, and the people that are attending the meeting are residents and they're really excited to have learning in this. And, and the way that maxillofacial surgeon does stuff is not identical to ENT and rhinologist. Yeah. And, and everyone could implement their armamentarium by knowing things like this. And I think that in the future, we can go ahead and talk about different techniques for intubation. And I will, I will, I will really be glad if you can take that too. So let's go, the, the question coming from <clears throat> China, this colleague is asking, what are the different rehabilitation techniques and after how many weeks you are performing rehabilitation in those patients? That's, so that's actually an excellent question because I think that is a part of facial trauma as a whole that sometimes gets forgotten, you know? And or colleagues that deal with long bone injuries, you know, the orthopedic surgeons, the traumatic surgeons, they do a much better job than, than we do uh, when, when working with our physical therapists and things like that. And I think that comes more into play when you have, you know, facial fractures that include your mandible, because that's really the one that needs the most uh, rehabilitation. And I usually start that, you know, very early on. As soon as a patient is able, you know, if a patient is extubated and it's even if it's an auto for a different injury, some, you know, sometimes it's as easy as giving a patient a little cheat with some exercises to, you know, make sure that five times a day you're open and closing your mouth, going lateral, laterally. Um, there is these different devices that you can do to help with the occlusion, to make sure they get more opening. But a, a simple, a simple way of doing it is really, and a cheap way of doing it is to actually use tongue depressors and you stack them. You know, if a patient is having a hard time opening the mouth, you can actually have, you know, stack them as much as they can and bite down on the tongue depressor and every day add one tongue depressor until you get the right occlusion. But I think it's key that you do that. You know, in, at least in our practice here in the US, uh, a lot of these patients tend to be treated in trauma centers. A lot of my patients, not all of them, but a lot of my patients are patients that are, are homeless, that are not the best patients that follow up in clinic. Uh, so you have to be really good about being clear on how you support these patients and give them a plan with the hope they get a good outcome. But that's key because you can do a great surgery. And if you don't pair that with, with the rehabilitation, then you're going to have poor outcomes. Another question from our Russian colleagues is asking what not to do in this fracture. What should be avoided? Uh, why, uh, <laughs> that is also a great <laughs> question. So I think number one, I think going back to that, that quote that I mentioned then that your first, your first shot at fixing this is your best shot of doing a good job. So I think the first thing is just to be honest by, with, with yourself. Like if you don't feel comfortable doing this case, uh, don't be shy to ask for help. And I don't know how it works maybe in Russia and other countries. Here in the US, this part of this, these kind of injuries are managed, depending on which night you come in, are managed by either us, plastic surgery, or oral surgeons, right? And we all have our little tips and a little, a little ways of, of doing things a little bit different. So if you're someone that's a resident or a young faculty that, that I wanna have to deal with this, I'm gonna wanna get better. You have a colleague, even if it's a colleague outside of your specialty, like an oral surgeon that maybe has more experience, invite them over. Like they, you know, at least I think that great, creates a great teamwork with these patients and you can learn from them. So I think my main thing is that don't do something you're gonna do a wrong, a wrong job the first time, okay? Uh, I think the other thing that it's, is very common is that people tend to address the easy fractures and selectively avoid the harder ones. So for example, one of the most common things that people, I, I didn't talk much about that in my talk, and these patients with a lot of facial fractures in the mid phase, when they have ANOE fractures, they, they, they ignore them. And then what happens is that you fix everything else and you don't go to the ANOE fracture and they and end up with this like, widened look, the telecanthus look that we talk about because we, you didn't address that. And it's because it's a fracture that maybe functionally doesn't affect much, but aesthetically informed it's going to affect a lot. So don't ignore fractures that you, that you see that need to be addressed. And the last thing will be don't ignore the soft tissue resuspension because I used to ignore that thinking that, oh, I just want to close and be done. And, and then that really affects the way your outcome comes later on in the patients. The other question is coming from France. And in fact, they asking if you have simultaneously soft tissue 
um, erosion and fractures, would you go for uh, vascular flap or free flap? Uh, I think, so that's a good question. So I, you know, and we see that a lot in, in ballistic injuries, you know, like in ballistic injuries, if you work in the military, of course, or, you know, in, in air, war zones, you see a lot with, with the explosions where not only you have to account for the physical affordable and trauma, but this high energy that just tends to destroy tissue. Um, so, you know, I actually have a good talk on ballistic trauma that maybe one day we can talk about. But one of the first things when you have these patients that have these horrific soft tissue injuries is that make sure you figure out what you have left. And as someone was telling me, give, give tissue a, a chance, like the Beatles used to say, give piece a chance, give tissue a chance. Some of that tissue might survive. And you may have more soft tissue than you think once you start cleaning things up and aligning. But if you have a look at that and you are missing a lot of soft tissue, then you take the same approach that you, we do in hernia cancer. You know, if you know if you need to have soft tissue coverage for the bone, you need to have soft tissue coverage for function because if you close it to in too much tension, then you're gonna have, you, you can pull the eyelid down and things like that. So that's when you have to think about regional flaps, advancing flaps, and in some cases you do have to do free flaps. I think the old school of thought with the use of free flaps. Uh, in facial trauma is that you do it delayed. No, like, let's wait until the patient heals, maybe a few months back. And I think nowadays more and more, we think that's a mistake because you wanna replace that soft tissue and sometimes soft and bone tissue with free flaps as early as possible before the scar and before that retraction of the tissues sets in. Because it's a lot harder to go back in four months later to replace a scar or a piece of meat face that's in there um, and then it is maybe a few weeks after the injury. So I think there's more and more a push to do those big complex reconstructions, even with free tissue transfers earlier on that we used to do maybe five, 10 years ago. The other questions coming from Kuwait, Kuwait and uh, our colleagues uh, is asking, what are the fracture that you would suggest not to operate? Fractures I really suggest to not operate. Uh, specifically in the mid phase. So, you know, one thing to keep in mind is that the mid phase, the missing fractures, except for the maxilla, but the, for example, your, your psychomatic fractures are, are not really weight bearing fractures, meaning that th these are not mobile bones, right? It's not like the mandible or, uh, or even the, the, the maxilla. So every now and then you'll see a, fa you know, a patient that has your typical tripod or tetraprod psychomatic fracture, but the bone is in place, the bone is in place the orbital floor fracture is, is in, it's small or there's, or there's none. So those are maybe fractures that you don't have to do anything about, right? So don't be shy about doing that. As long as the patient can make sure that the patient is not doing any activity that's gonna hit in the face again. Same thing with somatic arch fracture. Sometimes they're very mild uh, and you have nothing to do. You don't you have to do anything about it, to be honest. Um, but I think if you have the pterygoid, if you have a truly four fracture where your pterygoid plates are involved and you have a mobile, a mobile um, maxilla in a patient which has dentition, you have to do something about it because over time when you chew, you're gonna have a little bit of mobility and that can figure out, that can be actually an issue for non-union. Maybe in a patient that has a four one fracture and has no dentition, like an older patient that is just eating soft foods and you don't have to worry about occlusion, that, that maybe one and maybe has you know it's a sick patient and you want to take to the OR. That patient might do fine just with observation and soft mechanical diet. So that will be my 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 observations for that. I think that we have just time for one more question. This question is coming from the U.S. What are your suggestions for vertical fracture of the maxilla in the hard palate? Would you operate or you will not? Uh, so you, I, I'm guessing you're talking about when you have basically like a midline fracture like this. I get, I like guess, yeah. yeah. So again, it, it, it depends on the mobility. It, it's usually those fractures are in combination with other fractures. So, uh, and the hard part is that a lot of those patients, because they are sick, they're intubated. So you cannot, even if the scan shows that there's a fracture, but the bone is in the, might be in the right position, there's not really a good way of assessing occlusion before taking it to surgery because the patient cannot tell you if they feel that their dentition is off. Uh, 
But in most cases, it's off. You know, it, one thing to keep in mind that when you're talking about occlusion, it's amazing, like one millimeter off of your occlusion, people will know that they're off and it can be very annoying, right? So I tend to be more aggressive and I tend to play those patients. And sometimes all it requires, it's maybe a little mid plate, you know, put them in, in occlusion with arch bars or, you know, any sort of wiring. And then you just put a little plate, a two by two plate in the middle of the palate. Sometimes you have to go back and do, have to reinforce the trigger plates, but you have to do something about them because those patients will complain about their occlusion. And then if you wait months or until like six more weeks, it's gonna be a lot harder to put into place. You have to go there and refracture and that's a whole different ballgame. So I think that the take home message, I, I, I really hope that everyone understand mm -hmm. that what uh, uh, Osvaldo Henrique has just said is that the first shot is the best shot. So <laughs> if you take it in consideration that you are planning to do something, do your best. So plan your surgery initially, because otherwise you're making things complicated for you and your other colleagues. Yeah. So I think that we don't have enough, enough time. Plus it's very early and I really, uh, I'm really glad that you, you know, just reserve one hour for us to make some educational training for, uh, for our resident, for our colleagues. Uh, actually, a lot of other brilliant colleagues are watching those uh, international ground rounds and they are bringing you cheers. So thank uh -huh. you, Osvaldo, for being with us. Next time, of course, 2021, more coming for, uh, for the next uh, first semester, also from uh, Osvaldo and from others from the Emory University. No, thank hey. you, Osvaldo, for being with us. No, Puya, thank you so much. Uh, I will end by just sharing this thing real quick, just because I think it's a great resource for your viewers and all of us. But if you don't know about this resource, use it. This is the AO reference uh, uh, webpage. It's a free resource. And for example, just to showcase real quick, you can basically go here to CMF. Mm -hmm. And when you go here, you can basically pick your fracture. You can pick, you know, for example, you have the 4.1. And it tells you just how to access, you know, all the different information, how you reconstruct, how you can, how you can actually uh, fix the fractures. It's just a great resource to have from the AO. And just, it's there, it's free. You don't have to be a member. You don't have to sign in. You just basically Google AO reference, so you can reference. And it's a great resource for anything that has to do with management of facial, of facial fractures. So please make sure you take advantage of that resource. But again, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Everyone stay safe at home. Happy holidays. And thank you again, Puya, for having me here. It's always a pleasure, man. Uh, uh, do me a favor, please. Can you send me the link so I will put it in the, the description so that everyone I will can join just right now to the chat. For, uh, thank you so for much. Time. So stay safe, everyone. Uh, this is the last meeting for the 2020. Uh, we brilliantly close our semester. Uh, I hope next year, Everything is going to be better. Looking forward for the vaccines and looking forward for some health and some good news. So I will take advantage of it by saying that uh, we are going to uh, announce the next semester in uh, next week. And uh, hopefully, Osvaldo, take um, take message from you to accept my <laughs> invitation for the next semester. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.